rounding the curve towards the end. Um, so these last two lessons, today's lesson and next week's lesson, at this point, we are reaching the real reason that I wanted to teach a course like this, that I wanted to teach this particular class. Um, for the past you know, month or so, we've been learning about the composers of our melodies and we've learned the stories behind them. And that's fun and it deepens our understanding. And when we hear somebody sing Mayor Finkelstein's The Door by Door, we get that little, ooh, now we know something about it. But we also get some deeper benefits from learning about where our synagogue music comes from. And that was really what I wanted to explore in this class. When we put names to tunes, when we connect our melodies to specific people and specific places and specific circumstances, we are in a sense peeling back a curtain of tradition. We're destroying a little bit of a sense of mystique, but we're, the sense of mystique that we're destroying is a curtain that can cloak our music in anonymity. We're pulling back that curtain and we're seeing who's behind it. If we don't learn who composed our music, if we're the people who don't come to this class and we just sort of go about our daily business and believe that all of these melodies came from the past, broadly defined, we don't learn, we, le we don't learn whose voices we are hearing, the specific people that contributed to our tradition. And we also don't learn whose voices we might not be hearing, which I think is very important when we consider how music gets into synagogues. If we don't listen to voices that we wouldn't ordinarily think of as traditional, um, we might not, if we listen to these voices, if we, if we search and we look for voices that don't fit our image of who composed synagogue music, we realize that there are people that aren't middle-aged rabbis, you know, in black and white photos with beards. And we realize that this, that this is a living tradition, that this is not a museum. We're not looking at a sonic museum. We're looking at a living tradition. We're looking at a, a, a tradition that people continue to contribute to. And we also start to see new insights and new understandings of how Jewish prayer works new people who look at texts and say, this is what that text ought to sound like, or this is what that text can do in prayer. So tonight, we're gonna to be looking at some women composers. And ordinarily, thank you, Max, ordinarily, I would have preferred not to segregate all the women into one episode, um, but there is a point that I wanted to make about women composers, which is why they're all here. Um, women were shut out of public prayer leading and out of attributed and public uh, composition for a very, very long time. So the idea of women composing under their own names and being recognized for it, not just in the Jewish world, but in larger art music circles as well, is a relatively new one. And once that started to become more common, when women were finally able to compose under their own names, one of the things that we start to see are some interesting approaches to prayer that are at the same time, both very modern and surprisingly traditional. That is, you'd think that women would just come completely out of left field, but, or say, I'm gonna compose in the strictest of traditions, but women don't do that. Women bring some very particular insights to prayer um, because they're not necessarily bound by tradition. And so they pick and choose. Among the women that we will be talking about today is not Debbie Friedman. Um, I have chosen specifically not to talk about her today for a couple of reasons. And one is that aside from the fact that Rabbi Eric has been introducing her Misha Bera recently, we don't actually use a whole lot of Debbie Friedman's music at Becky. And whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, I leave up to you. We don't use a whole lot of her music and I really wanted this course to focus on what we use at Becky. And another reason that the main reason that I chose not to talk about Debbie Friedman today is that she in some sense has become almost too well known. Um, it is very, very easy 
to find her story, to listen to the words of people who knew her, to listen to her music. The influence of Debbie Friedman is such that she's almost to become a symbol for a particular genre of synagogue music, this sort of late 20th century folk rock style. People say, oh yeah, that Debbie Friedman style music. When they're describing music, A, that Debbie Friedman didn't compose and B, that she never would have composed. So again, Debbie Friedman's name is almost becoming another one of those curtains of anonymity that we might need to pull back and discover some of the other women who are not Debbie Friedman, who are writing our synagogue music. So the first of these women, I will show you, uh, we'll, we'll, start the, we'll start the pictures, is Nurit Hirsch. Nurit Hirsch is born in 1942 in Israel. You can see a picture of her as a young woman and then later on, later on in her life at a, at a concert. So she's born in 1942, she's still alive. She studied at the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv. And like all Israelis, she served a mandatory period in the IDF. She did her service in the entertainment corps. So she was a musician even then. And when she left the army in 1965, she began to compose. Um, so we'll stop the share for a second. So she started composing in 1965. She was you know, 23 years old. And so she got a bit of a head start. She had this music education. And in 1969, a new music festival started up in Israel, it was uh, founded by a music producer named Mickey Peleg. It was called the Hasidic Song Festival. This uh, festival ran from 1969 until about 1992 when it just basically ran out of steam. Um, so it was launched in the wake of the Six Days War. About between 1969 and 1993, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, Israel really found its footing as a country. It sort of, it defeated some enemies. It had some military victories. It kind of gained confidence. It was saying, okay, we can do this. We can be a country. Um, and one of the things that Israeli musicians wanted to do was to try and make an Israeli stamp on music. And so Mickey Peleg launched the Hasidic Song Festival. Now the Hasidic Song Festival was not a festival of Hasidic music. In fact, a lot of Hasidim in Israel really hated the Hasidic Song Festival because they thought the music was too modern and they really didn't like that women were allowed to enter the festival as composers, as singers, and as dancers. The point of the festival was for composers to take liturgical texts and set them to new music. So in 1969, the first, the first of, the, of, of these festivals, Nurit Hirsch entered a piece and she won third prize with this piece. So every year the Hasidic Song Festival put out um, a recording, they're on LPs, you can get them on like eBay and places like this of the 10 finalists in the Hasidic Song Festival. And, you know, Nareed Hirsch's song will be on the first one. So she won third prize. Nobody remembers, unless you have that recording from 1969, nobody really cares who the first and the first and second prize winners were. What everybody remembers is the third place winner, Nareed Hirsch's song, which we're going to hear now. crowd goes wild, of course. We know this piece of music. This is, this is the sort of music that 
I was at a synagogue many years ago and that song was sung and a woman who was probably my mother's age was sitting near me said, oh my goodness, I love that song. My grandmother sang it at synagogue when I was a little girl. And because occasionally I have a, self, a sense of self-preservation, um, I didn't say, no, your grandmother didn't sing that. <laughs> it was composed in 1969. Your grandmother was 117 years old by that point. Um, but it's that sort of, it, it has that singability and it's very, it's very short, it's very accessible. People immediately took to it like they'd known it all their life. Um, and this song, th this really helped kickstart Nareed Hirsch's composing career. This song became her calling card because it is that good. So among other things, um, she's composed, this is a really fun thing about Nareed Hirsch. She has composed a couple of Israel's entries for the Eurovision Song Contest. Did, is there, is there, are there people on this call who don't know what the Eurovision Contest is? In, just in case there, in case there are, the Eurovision contest has been held since 1955. Um, it was one of those things that Europe developed after World War II, so that the European countries could compete with each other without shooting at each other. Um, it's open to anyone who was in the European Broadcast Union, which is why Israel, which is very much not in Europe, is part of Eurovision. Um, they've opened up to a couple of other countries since then. Countries will submit videos. Um, there's rules for the type of song that, that you can submit. And finalists perform at a concert and people all over Europe, anyone in a European country is eligible to vote. And the winner is, it, it's basically an electronic applause meter The winner is decided that way. And then the winning country gets to host Eurovision for next year. Um, Israel entered Eurovision the for, for the first time in 1975, um, and they were singing a song called Esham, uh, which Nurit Hirsch had composed, and she also conducted it. We ha actually have a photo of her doing that. Nurit Hirsch conducted at Eurovision, and she was only the second woman to conduct a, a, a piece at Eurovision. And the reason she was second was that at the same contest in 1975, another woman was conducting about a half hour before she was. So Nareet Hirsch and this other woman became the first two women conductors at Eurovision. So that year with Esham, Israel placed fourth, but they kept going. And in 1978, Israel won Eurovision for the first time with another one of Nareet Hirsch's songs, a song called Abba Nibi, which is one of the most 1978 songs I can possibly think of. It is kind of cheerful. It's kind of disco-y. It's about little kids singing about love using the Hebrew equivalent of pig Latin. It is completely danceable. It's completely silly. Israel then went on to win next year in 1979. So back to back wins, but Nareed Hirsch was not involved in that. It's a much more serious song next year. Um, so the other song you might know very well that Nareed Hirsch composed is Bashana Habaa. So, she, so she's also the composer of that. So she's had this long career as a songwriter and she works with lyricists a lot too. Um, her music is part of sort of a wave of Israeli composition um, in which Israel has tried to reach out to connect with the rest of the Jewish world. Um, Israel sometimes has a problem, kind of, it, it's not always very good at connecting with Jews in the diaspora, um, you know, either politically or socially or in its attitude towards religion, but music, Israeli music is really one of the, was one of the earliest ways that Israel and the diaspora connected. Um, there's a wave of mid 20th century Israeli pop music, Arab Shel Shoshanim, we use that as a uh, as a liturgical melody at Becky. Um, there, there, there was some, I mean, there, there's a lot of Israeli folk dance around, of course, and there's a lot of these sort of pop compositions. So, and, and Nareed Hirsch is sort of part of that wave, part of that wave of mid 20th century Israeli composers who are sort of trying to make a place, for, make a voice for Israel 
in the modern Jewish world. So she, co she combines themes and she sometimes samples little bits of Western art music, um, but she does it in the sort of folk pop style. Remember that she had some classical training at the Music Academy in Tel Aviv. And so what she's doing essentially, is she's taking a very European approach to music, but she's democratizing it. Western art music has always been in some sense music of the elite, it was the music of the courts and of the church, and it was only in the 19th century that middle class people were able to go to concerts, and we still think of it as kind of highbrow. And Nareet Hirsch sort of takes the ideas of that style of music and makes them accessible to ordinary people. And she says, somebody asked her about this once, and she said that she doesn't do this intentionally that it sort of happens instinctively and intuitively um, because she did have this training at the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv, which was a music school that was set up by art music composers who moved to Israel to found or Palestine at that point, they moved to Palestine in the twenties and thirties to help found a new Israeli style of classical music, which is very, very modernist. And she studied with them. So she has two children. And the reason that I bring this up is that her daughter, it's a woman named Ruth Rosenfeld, is a singer, is a performer. And what I wanted to, uh, what I want to invite you to do now is to listen to Ruth Rosenfeld singing her mother's setting. So this is the, the music by Nareed Hirsch of a poem by Itzik Monger. Itzik Monger was one of the great Yiddish poets. And this is a song called Mitfermach de Eugen with closed eyes. It's a poem that Itzik Monger wrote um, on the theme that when you kneel down, when you're, in, when you're in extremis, when you're in distress, you feel the greatness of the divine ever more closely. So I thought you might like to hear this song sung by Nareed Hirsch's daughter. So we'll listen to a little bit of that. Vermachte Eugen, hörst du hinter dem Jam, mit Fiebern dicke Finger, fühlst du geringer dem Gram. Die goldene Pave, da kennst du ihn fliehen, unabhängig wird schöner, wenn sie es vernichtet. So you can really see where that art music influence comes from, but you can also see that this isn't, this is something that you could just imagine learning and singing. It's not art music that is removed from you. So that is a little bit about Nareet Hirsch. I'm gonna move on a little bit. We have three composers to talk about today. And the second composer that I want to uh, share with you, we'll, we'll see her picture, is Rabbi Shefa Gold. Rabbi Shefa Gold was born in New York in 1954. Uh, she grew up in New Jersey and she received her rabbinic ordination through the, rabbin the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1996. But, so we, we, we can see her here, um, but she also received a second ordination and it was a personal or ordination from Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi. And Rabbi Zalman was one of the founders of the Jewish renewal movement. So she has a reconstructionist ordination and a renewal ordination. And right now, um, Rabbi Gold is one of the spiritual leaders at Aleph, which is the headquarters of the renewal movement. If you go on their webpage and look under their personnel, she's, she'll be about halfway down the page. So in order to understand sort of what Shefa Gold's music is about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jewish renewal, which is a movement that I think a lot of us don't know very much about. It's a newish movement. It's based in 60s counterculture and also in the Havara trend, the sort of private prayer circle trend that really took, uh, took off in the 70s. Aleph itself, the sort of organized arm of Jewish renewal was founded in 1993. So it's very, very recent. Jewish renewal 
is a move, the aim of Jewish renewal is to revive and reconnect and reinstate ideas that are drawn from the early Hasidic mystical practices. They're all about music. They're all about mysticism. They're into meditation and gender equality and a particular kind of really physically ecstatic prayer. So they're, they're taking these ideas that the that the Baal Shem Tov really started in the 18th century and they're bringing them into the modern era. Um, this kind of work, this kind of very physical, very ecstatic, very meditative spiritual work, it bypasses the intellect. You're supposed to turn off your brain a little bit. And it's meant, what it's meant to do is to allow your prayer to become deeper and sort of more emotionally grounded. They want you to feel your prayer as much as think it. But as much as they are drawing from 18th century Hasidic mysticism, they're not about just sort of reviving Hasidism. They, they're, they're not Hasidic Jews. They, what they want to do is to take the ideas, but express them in a much more modern and much more sort of relevant and gender equality way. Um, so Rabbi Gold is her at her angle on this, she comes to she comes to renewal and brings with brings with her the idea of chant. So we're making a distinction here. This isn't Torah chanting. This isn't those sort of little motifs that you bring together to read the Torah scroll. This is the kind of meditative, repetitive chanting of a single line of text to a relatively simple tune. And the goal of this kind of chant, so you know, think Eastern meditation. The goal is to get your body sort of vibrating and kind of meditating on that one text and letting it, letting it sort of fill you. Um, a lot of people have uh, related Rabbi Gold's music to the Hindu practice of kirtan chanting. So this is something that Hindus, um, Hindus of some traditions will have these sort of meditative chant, sort of one line of devotion to a particular deity. And they'll just chant this line over and over again and allow themselves to feel the devotion to the deity. And it's called kirtan. Um, Rabbi Gold has said that she's not a serious student of kirtan. Again, a lot of her music kind of resonates with kirtan as said by people who know something about kirtan. And so we at Becky, we're familiar with several of her chants, although we may not know that they are hers. Um, and my favorite of these chants, I, you know, three or four of them are in pretty regular use in synagogues around the world. And in fact, my favorite of them is something that Rabbi Eric used this past Shabbat. And one of the great things about Zoom is that if everybody is muted, then everybody can sing and nobody will hear whether you're on key or not. So what I'd like to do, rather than play a recording of this chant, is I want to lead you all in it so that you can experience it the way that Shefa Gold wants you to, because she doesn't want you to, this isn't music for listening to. This is music for feeling. This is music for repeating. So, that, so this is a chant that has a line and then an answering line. Um, so we're going to sing it. So we're going to sing it a couple of times, not too loud. We're going to alternate a little bit between the A and B tunes. And as we sing, concentrate on how your body is feeling. Be conscious of your breathing. Be conscious of the way your your chest vibrates when you sing, um, and just the feeling that you get when you sing this. So the A tune, Ozi. Vezimratya Vaili Lishua The B tune Ozi Vezimratya Vaili Sing this with me. Oh, Ziva Zimratya Vaili Lishua. Oh, Ziva Zimratya. See you. 
how that feels. And imagine singing this over, not just, you know, a couple of times, imagine singing this for five minutes, for 10 minutes, and just really letting yourself sink into the sound. Imagine the harmonies that people might come up with. And they have really a long time just to think about this. And that's, that's what her music is about. That is how Shefa Gold approaches prayer. Uh, the Woodstock Vermont Times interviewed her in 2013. And here's what she had to tell them. She says, quote, being a rabbi is teaching people how to use the traditions of Judaism to live a life that's open-hearted and loving, questioning, seeking. At the synagogue, there were so many words that had to be said, it felt frustrating to me. But if I could tune in to one phrase at a time and make the music bring that phrase alive, the liturgy would be invigorated. I heard a very similar statement from Cantor Benji Ellen Schiller once, who told me, well, she, I was part of a lesson she was leading. She told the group that when she started seriously attending services at Hillel in college, she only knew four words of Hebrew, but she could sing. And she allowed the music to bring her into prayer. And she now teaches cantors at Hebrew Union College. So, you know, she did, she did find a way into prayer from there. Um, Cantor Tamar Havilio, who is an administrator at Hebrew Union College's Jerusalem campus, told me once, I was interviewing her, she told me that she thought that Debbie Friedman had brought the body back to Judaism, which, you know, in a certain sense is probably true. You know, if Debbie Friedman brought the body back, Rabbi Shefa Gold, her chants really took, ran with that, just took it, deepened it. This is music that you feel in your chest. It's a very physical way of experiencing prayer. So she's, Rabbi Gold is most famous for these chants. She has occasionally written longer and sort of more melodic songs. But even in those songs, she'll still focus on one very short piece of text, and she'll often give an English translation just to make sure that everybody knows what the piece is about. So we're gonna to listen to a little bit of one. This is called uh, Eagle's Wings. So I'll get that going. We can listen to all of these pieces for ages and ages, but we'd be here all night. So there, I'm sure there are some of you who are sitting in, sitting in your homes listening to this and thinking, this sounds a bit woo-woo. And you're not wrong. There is a bit of woo-woo in this, but I mean, it's sort of modern woo-woo. In recent years, there's been a real vogue for mysticism, for spirituality. Think of all the people who would answer a Pew survey saying they're spiritual, but not religious. So th there's been a trend for this kind of individualistic, you know, sort of vision quest like spirituality um, and combining Eastern and Western religious practices. Um, and a lot of this kind of work also centers on the concept of the divine feminine which has been to a certain extent pushed out of a lot of modern monotheistic tradition. 
Um, and certainly Rabbi Gold's work, you can totally see her work is pulling from this idea, the sort of modern interest in mysticism, spirituality, the divine feminine. But she remember that she's also pulling, she's combining this with very, very deep Jewish tradition. The idea of using short repetitive chants to build up spiritual energy. If you take away the words, if you substitute syllables, you have a nigun, you have a Hasidic nigun. This was what the Baal Shem Tov wanted his disciples to be able to do. Think about this. You can almost see a group of 18th and 19th century Hasidim singing this and dancing because it, it, it's drawing both from the sort of modern mystical spiritualism, but also from the Jewish version of that. The Maskilim uh, were the traditional opponents of the Hasidim. The Maskilim were the people who really wanted to intellectualize Judaism, the, where the Hasidim really wanted to physicalize it and spiritualize it. The Maskilim about the same time really were part of the intellectual tradition. And from the Maskilim come, comes Reform Judaism and to a certain extent, conservative Judaism and even some strains of orthodoxy really have this sort of Maskilic bent. This, the the Maskilim were the adherents of the Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment. They wanted to concentrate on the intellectual value, the value of Judaism. They valorized study. They elevated the mind over the body. And of course, you know, they shut women very much out of this type of scholarship. And so when the, the second wave feminist movement started in the 60s and the, in, and the 70s and the 80s, and then sort of transformed in the 90s, um, pro progressive Jewish women, women in the reform and conservative and reconstructionist movements, they didn't really feel like they had a place in this very intellectualized tradition. But there was this sort of spiritualist tradition that had been allowed to sort of fall by the wayside. And this was something that women could reclaim. Um, if the men had abandoned this approach to Judaism, women could pick it up and women could say, we have this traditional grounding. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's see what we can bring to this very physical approach to Judaism. And it worked very well, particularly with the early second wave feminist movement, which was very centered on the body. This was the era of our bodies, ourselves, of women sort of saying, we want to know our bodies, we want to know how they work, we want to establish healthcare, we want to understand, you know, we, want, we, we, we don't want women to be physically second-class citizens. So this, this focus on the body in Jewish music, I think really did come from women. Um, and so what they did, they, they reintroduced this kind of mysticism and this kind of spirituality back into Jewish life. And that is the other tradition that Rabbi Gold is working with. So she's blending this sort of a, a type of feminist history, a type of modern approach to spirituality, and this very, very old Hasidic tradition into chants like this. So it sounds a little woo-woo-y, but there, I, there's some depth to it. And try singing those chants the way she would want you to sing them very physically, very meditatively for a while. And they do wonderful things to your mind. And so the last woman, the last woman that I want to talk to you about is Flory Jagoda. Flory Jagoda is, so we have uh, a picture of her as a young woman and as an older woman. This is the same accordion in both pictures. And, uh, a, a publicity picture that she would have used for albums and for concerts. So Flory Jagoda is a little bit of the odd woman out in this group because Flory didn't compose liturgical music. We don't really use her music in services because it's not liturgical. But she did compose a melody that I think that just about everybody knows and that we probably all enjoy singing each year. The song Ocho Candelicas 
sounds like it ought to be a really old Ladino song. You, you'd think maybe it comes from Turkey that people were singing it around the turn of the 20th century. Um, it's actually not. It's Flory Jagoda's original composition and she wrote it in 1983. And what we're going to hear is a performance of her and two of her bandmates uh, singing it, but she has some instructions for you about how this song should sound. Okay. That's a child singing. I didn't tell you. The all is everybody. And it's a healthy American all. Huh? So let's go. <laughs> We all know Ocho Candelica. And this kind of composition is Flory Jagoda's legacy. The idea that Ladino is a language that we can still sing in. If we know something about Ladino, if we like singing songs in Ladino, if very occasionally we switch out our Hebrew enkelohenu for a Ladino non como nuestro señor, if we're able to do that, Flory Jagoda is basically the reason that we in the US can do that. So she was born in Sarajevo in 1923. Um, her, she was born Flora Papo. Uh, she, so she was born in Sarajevo when her mother, re, um, her father died when she was young. Her mother remarried a fellow named Michael Cabilio. They moved to Zagreb. And when she was a teenager, the second world war broke out. So Flory Jagoda escaped the Nazis when she was 17 years old. And it was her stepfather who helped her to do it. Um, he saw that the Nazis were starting to close in on Zagreb and he got false identity papers for Flory. He got her a train ticket to Split, which is the second largest city in Croatia. And right before she got on the train, he took the yellow armband off of her coat. So she had false identity papers. She didn't have the yellow star on. And Flory brought her accordion, that accordion that you saw in the picture. And she played the accordion all the way from Zagreb to Split, got everybody on the train singing along with her, and no one asked to see her ticket or her papers. And that was how she got out of Zagreb. Once she got to Split, the Italian army, which was... They were allied with the Germans, but they had some disagreements. And the Italian army essentially decided to hide a group of Yugoslavian Jewish refugees from the Nazis. And Flory was among this group. So she, they shuffled them off to a couple of islands in the Adriatic Sea. And eventually Flory ended up working as a translator for the American army, which was how she met an American soldier named Harry Jagoda and they got married and she moved to the United States with him and later found out that 42 members of her family were killed in the Holocaust. This did not include her mother. Her mother actually came to the US and lived with her for a while. Um, Flora and Harry lived a lot of their lives in Virginia. And for a while, Flory was giving music lessons and she was a member of various folk music clubs. And like I said, her mother came to live with them. Her mother wouldn't speak Ladino. Her mother just would not talk about her life before the war. This is the war trauma. And then her mother died in 1972 and Flory really started to reassess her family history and say, I don't want this to be lost. And so she started thinking about the Ladino folk songs that she'd learned from her grandmother, which her mother wouldn't sing because of the war trauma. And that was when Flory started giving concerts and reviving interest in Ladino music so that she could pass this legacy on to her children and grandchildren before it was forgotten. 
So in 1989, she recorded an album called Cantica Stimi Nonna, which means songs of my grandmother. And it's mostly folk songs that she had learned from her grandmother um, in Yugoslavia. And then in 1992, she recorded another album. It was actually her third album. Um, but this album was sort of a spiritual sequel to Cantica Stimi Nonna. It's called La Nonna Canta, which means the grandmother sings. And it's a wonderful album because the first one is songs that her grandmother sang. And then in La Nona Canta, she's the grandmother now. And she's now composing new Ladino songs that she wants to pass on to her children and her grandchildren to keep them alive. So what we're gonna to listen to is a little bit, is a song called La Mezuza di Aronico, Little Aaron's Mezuzah, where she tells her grandchildren that little Aaron has a mezuzah and you must give it a very sweet and tasty kiss. So we'll, we'll listen to a little bit of that. Cuando entras la casa a Cuando entras la casa a Jesús, con un pesico dulce y sabroso, con un pesico dulce y sabroso. So there's a little sample of the type of music that she writes. And so in the last couple of decades of her life, Flori Jagoda was this incredibly popular and charismatic folk singer. She was a concert artist, composer, leader in the revival of interest in Latino language and in Sephardic music in general. Uh, she worked with the Virginia Folklife Program at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. And she was honored as a Virginia master folk artist in uh, 2014. We actually have a photograph of the certificate. Uh, Cantor Aviva Chernik was one of her official apprentices. So we've got that there. Um, she, wor she worked with a couple of other musicians um, to form a trio. Um, so uh, Susan Gaida, Howard Bass, and Aviva Chernik. And Susan Gaida and Howard Bass have now, uh, they're working with Tina Chansey. They have a group called Trio Sephardi. So they're continuing uh, Flora Jagoda's, they're continuing to perform Flora Jagoda's music. And she has received a number of different national awards, including the uh, US Immigrant Achievement Award in 2003. For the last 10 years of her life, she didn't perform very much because she had dementia. And she died almost a year, a little over a year ago. She died on January 29th of 2021. So a lot of people who knew her have been thinking about her recently. So we have three very, very different women composers that we've heard about here. And they're making this wonderfully wide range of music. We have Nurit Hirsch, who's taking the sort of European style compositional techniques and democratizing them, sort of making Israeli music kind of a thing in American synagogues. And we have Rabbi Shefa Gold, who's combining Hasidic spirituality and second wave feminism and a sort of new age approach to mysticism um, and is sort of helping us reconnect physically to our prayer. And then we have Flori Jagoda, who's reminding us that the Jewish story isn't just Yiddishkeit, that there's this whole rich, wonderful Sephardic Ladino tradition. And that if we in the United States really want to be a pluralistic and welcoming Jewish community, that we should also be listening to and looking into Ladino and Sephardic music. So women really have a history of doing things that they are not expected to be doing. We have this image, and to a certain extent, this still persists today. We have this image of women as not being creators of music, either sacred music or secular. We, we've sort of come around to the idea that women perform music we're still sometimes a little surprised to think of women as creators of music. And a large part of the reason for this is that women have historically been shut out of the institutions 
that supported official music compositions. So women were cut off from Jewish prayer leadership. And to a certain extent, women didn't have access to the courts, the, the European courts or the, to the church system that supported art music. Even into the 19th century, Felix Mendelssohn's older sister, Fanny, who was probably a better composer than Felix was, didn't publish a lot of her music under her own name during her lifetime. In fact, a number of pieces that she did have published were published under Felix's name. Musicologists have just now been starting to figure out this is actually not a Felix Mendelssohn piece, it's Fanny, but he published it under his name because a lot of music publishers were much happier to publish Felix Mendelssohn than Fanny Hensel. So, you know, women just didn't have this support and yet women have always been creative and that creativity has found a way to come out. And we now have a much more open social structure and an open religious structure. We have gender equality in many, many synagogues in the country. And we have, we have, a way, we have ways for women's creativity to be heard and for women's approaches to prayer. What happens when a group of people who have been cut off from the traditions of prayer, decide they want to enter. Men, male cantors are often compared to Yossela Rosenblatt and Adolf Kachko and Moishi Oisher. You know, if you're a male cantor, can you sound like the golden age cantors? Well, women aren't expected to do that. Women don't have that particular monkey on our backs. Women cantors can sound like whatever they want to because there is no serious tradition or that there is now, but when women started being cantors, there was no serious tradition of chazanas in a woman's voice. Women were able to take chazanas and make it their own, and they were able to take other approaches to Jewish music and make it their own. So yeah, it's, and it's easy to forget that these women exist when we don't credit them. And we can't, we, there's no real way to credit composers during a service, but that's one of the reasons that it's important to learn about Jewish music is to learn what happens when women start singing. What if we learn about LGBT, LGBTQ composers? What if we were to learn about Black or Asian Jewish composers? You can, you can start to see whose voices have been honored, whose voices maybe are missing. And maybe we start to open up a little bit and we start to listen to new voices and to new approaches to prayer. So next week is the wrap up. Unfortunately, that all good things must come to an end. Um, so usually I like to be a little bit mysterious about who we're gonna be talking about next week. Today, I'm going to come right out and say, we're gonna talk about Shlomo Karlobach and we'll talk about other things, but the major composer will be addressing is Shlomo Karlobach. And what that means is that we will be talking about sexual abuse. And so I wanted to just give people a heads up. So if this is something that you maybe need to take a little time for, or maybe watch the recording later on, or just know that this topic is going to come up. And we'll, we will talk about Shlomo Karlobach, but we'll also you know, look back at how congregational music works. Maybe we'll discuss a little bit about where we might want Becky to go musically and sort of wrap up this idea of knowing who contributed to our tradition, who gave us the songs that we sing. So I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so if you have questions, raise your hand in the reactions box and we'll try to call on you in order of uh, the raised hands. I think everybody's just stunned. Um, that does tend to happen. Oh, I see that, that Max has some more and Max put in a bunch of, oh, great. That's Let's, great. I'm I, happy to listen to these after the fact. Yeah. I, I, do, have a, I do have a question. Yes. Um, I, I'm, so, so it's very interesting. I, I, um, I had forgotten that Fuller Jagoda didn't get, um, didn't, um, didn't really get into uh, music until later in life. I'm sorry, into public, into kind of promoting um, Ladino music so publicly until later in life. Um, of course, she was, as you noted, she was into music early in life, and that was that was really important. Um, but to, to kind of being the popularizer of Ladino music that many of us know her as. So I'm wondering, like, what the 
do, do you know much about what the pro the process was? Kind of how did that exit? It happened really quickly, right? That like Ocho Candelicas became um, really well known, and that she became kind of like a figure of Latino music. So is there is there more story um, to that that you know so much, or was it just that people were like, "Wow, this is really cool," and and that was that? Well, she, she had spent uh, she'd spent the time between coming to the United States and her mother's death, sort of being a music teacher and becoming a member of these folk music clubs. So she really had a basis. She had, um, she, she, she had some contacts. She was a member of multiple folk music clubs. And around that time, you know, it, it was the end of the folk music revival. And people were interested in general in all sorts of traditional music. Klezmer started to be revived in the seventies. And, you know, people started to, the, the, the cultural atmosphere, I think, was kind of ripe, and she was able to start working with the Virginia Folklife Foundation because she had all these contacts in the area. Um, people were starting to look at Renaissance music more seriously. Um, essentially, it was, it was the time for the, we want something new in life. And she really, and, you know, and she was also an older woman at the time, and she was, she was one of these people, she you know, she was one of these people who could say, this is, a this is a tradition. I learned this from my grandmother. I'm the real deal. And, you know, this, was, this is the era when the first, second, and third Jewish catalogs are published. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you, um, I have a copy of the third one. My parents have a copy of the, of the first one. It's basically DIY hippie dippy Judaism. Um, this is an era when people, particularly I think in the reform movement, but also in the conservative movement as well, are starting to get a little sick of this sort of very formalized structured service and want something new. And Sephardic music is at the same time kind of traditional and folky and was also very new to people at the time. So yeah, I think it was, the time was right. She had spent decades building up these contacts and people were eager to hear her. She also met and worked with a number of different music producers and musicologists. Uh, my friend Judith Cohen um, is a, a colleague of mine. She's at York University. She, she and Flory got very, very close and they, they worked together quite a bit on Sephardic music. Great, thank you. Anybody else have a last question or comment before I start? promoting future events. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. As always, fascinating. Lots to think about, lots to hum about in the next week. Um, and so please come next Monday night for our last meeting of this class, same time, same Zoom station, et cetera. Um, and coming up in the future, uh, next Wednesday evening, there is a prayer and liturgy uh, schmooze that's run by Carol Koenig and uh, Rabbi Carl Astor. They have their own Zoom um, URL, so just check the happenings for that. And I was thinking about it as, as we're going into depth in the music of the liturgy, they are probing the, and learning about the depths of the liturgy itself. And so have been over time, slowly, little by little, analyzing and talking about um, the prayers that we say. And you don't have to have been coming, you don't have to, you know, anybody is welcome. So I just wanted to put in a plug for that. The following week, I'm really excited because we have a woman coming whose name is Jennifer Moses. I have to find my flyer because I have to read it to you. She is, um, she's a visual artist and a writer and she's going to be talking about her most recent book called The Man Who Loved His Wife, which is a book of short stories. And here's what the Jerusalem Post says about her. Um, Jennifer Moses' book of short stories is a wry, unsentimental commentary on modern Jewish American life. Her great skill is in conjuring up from her most fertile imagination, wholly believable human beings, and each is believable because each has been imagined so fully. Um, I started reading her, the book that she recently wrote, The Man Who Something His Wife. I can never keep that one in my head. The Man Who Loved His Wife should just be able to keep that one. Um, and it's available, I think, through Amazon. I got it on my Kindle. It's fun. It's wonderful. It's, um, 
it's uh, much better than I expected. I, I, cause I thought of her first as a visual artist. I didn't realize that she also had a lot of skill as a writer and I'm totally enthralled. So check it out. And uh, that will be on the 23rd, Wednesday, 7.30. And thanks for coming. It's great to see everyone. Um, oh, right, we want people here, Cynthia is saying, we want people to buy from the gift shop. Oh, so she has the books. Great, so Harriet, the, the gift shop has books, so please buy those. And I will, as I said, it's it's easy reading, it's interesting. Um, she reminds me a little bit of Grace Paley. I don't know if anybody here is a Grace Paley fan, um, but similar, you know, Jew, short stories with a lot of Jewish content, but not just about being Jewish. I don't know, it's sort of about being human. So, uh, all right, so we'll see you all soon and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and I'll see you guys next week. Much Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks. Okay.